Uh, the SOL SOQ um, subcommittee for education will come to order. As quorum is present, the committee um, will get to work. And so if you could please mark your presence on the electronic, electronic touch screen. The roll. So we have a, a lot on our agenda today, as we can tell by the crowded room. And so I will first would like to just thank everybody for being here and for coming out to advocate for all of these issues. We're, we're glad to see this room full. Um, but we're going to start with some, some administrative tasks. And so uh, first, we need to strike three bills from the docket, House Bills 415, 446, and 1515. So can I get a motion to strike those three? There's been a motion and a second. Uh, to strike bills 1415, 1446, and 1515, members will cast their vote on the electronic voting system. Clerk will close the roll. Uh, those bills are struck. And so now we will start with the business of the day. Uh, and we will start with Delegate Aird and House Bill 1316. Delegate Aird, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, members of the committee. Before you should be House Bill 1316. Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, since 1984, the Board of Education has been making recommendations for changes to the standards of quality. And at its October 2019 meeting, it has recommended several additional changes. However, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, just as a reminder, I'd like to start with, although the board has offered these recommendations, you know, as I know, that our Constitution states that these are subject to revision only by the General Assembly. Mr. Chairman, while I could open further with my own anecdote as to the importance of these SOQs, what you can expect this morning is a brief overview of the specifics of the legislation and then brief personal testimony from our teachers, administrators, and educators who are on the front line of these issues every day. So really quickly, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, House Bill 1316 revises the Code of Virginia to reflect the Virginia Board of Education's new recommended standards. House Bill 1316 includes the creation of an equity fund, which would combine existing at-risk add-on programs with SOL prevention, intervention, and remediation programs and add an additional $270 million in new state funds in the new two-year budget. HB 1316 includes the development of teacher leader and teacher mentor programs, class size reduction, and experienced teacher for K through three and principal mentorship. Furthermore, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, staffing in Virginia schools have declined over the past decade, while enrollment has increased by more than 55,000. School staff are faced with overwhelming student caseloads. House Bill 1316 increases staffing for specialized student support, such as social workers, school nurses, school psychologists, school counselors, assistant principals, English learner teachers, reading specialists, and elementary school principals. Student caseloads for many vital positions exceed nationally recommended standards. And schools with lower student caseloads for counselors have better graduation rates, higher attendance, and fewer disciplinary incidents than schools with higher caseloads. And this is particularly true in high poverty schools. Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, I appreciate the historic efforts that have been recommended through the budget to date, but Virginia must adequately staff its schools and fully fund these new SOQ standards, and we can't afford to wait. I'd like to leave you with this. In UVA's president, Dr. Jim Ryan's book, Five Miles Away, A World Apart, he states, the unrealistically low base aid is the fundamental flaw in school finance in Virginia. And if you let that sink in, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, he is right. And we have an opportunity this year to change it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Do members of the committee have questions for the patron? Uh, those that want to testify in favor, if you could step to the podium. And 
I, I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't say keep your remarks as brief as possible because we have a lot of bills with a lot of testimony today. Um, and so. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, I'm Kathy Bercher with the Virginia Education Association. You can probably tell from looking over my shoulder that we are in strong support of um, this piece of legislation. We are incredibly grateful to Delegate Aird for truly showing the courage to bring this kind of bill forward. Um, the BEA has long supported the efforts by the Board of Education to update and establish staffing ratios that reflect not just prevailing practice, but the true needs of our students. This bill does just that. Um, I will say that the Virginia Education Association worked incredibly closely with the Board of Education. They implemented many of our recommendations, which we are very grateful for. I will just flag for you the only, there are two small areas where the VEA wants to make sure we take a good look. We would love to see registered nurses, um, appreciate the approach taken by the board in specialized student support, um, but the VEA believes that for our many of our students, school is where they receive their health care, frankly, and so having a registered nurse in those buildings is important to us. We all, our only concern in the equity fund is the redistribution of teachers, um, but wanted to flag that for you, but we appreciate Delegate Air and again, the courage it takes to pass this very large piece of legislation, which will do tremendous good for the students across the Commonwealth. Good morning, Chairman and members of the subcommittee. My name is Melandra Coleman, and I am a teacher at John Marshall High School here in Richmond City. I am here today in support of HB 1316 for my students. Each and every student has a right to high quality education. And here in Richmond, we're working around the clock to make that a reality. But what I see on a daily basis are barriers that keep us from fulfilling the promise that we as the Commonwealth have made to our students. What I see are under-resourced schools in our highest need communities. And what is a resource of which we are in great need in RPS? I'm so glad that you asked. We're in desperate need, especially at the high school level, level, an area which is often ignored, of reading specialists and reading curricula. Many of our high school students, at least at my school, are two or three years below grade level in reading, and that impacts classroom behavior, high stakes testing, ability to succeed in classes, and future employment, and the list goes on. So I'm here today to cry out for human and academic resources that will level the literacy playing field and the future success of our students. Additionally, did you know that state Statewide, the highest poverty schools spend less per student than our lowest poverty schools. This is backwards. Morally, it's backwards. And financially, it's backwards. Studies show increased spending has much more pronounced benefits for students from low-income families in terms of improving outcomes. The legislation before you sees the inequity of our current funding model and creates an equity fund that begins to modernize our education funding by recognizing that each student is not the same and that funding should reflect student needs. I urge urge the committee to consider the needs of our students living in poverty and to have courage to go beyond the governor's budget and support HB 1316 today. Thank you for your time and consideration. All right. Hello, my name is Luis Luna. I am a uh, social studies teacher and soccer coach with Richmond Public Schools. Um, I'm here today in support of Delegate Aird's uh, HB 1316. Um, five of my students have been killed, and four have, been uh, have, been, have committed homicides, yet for me, all of them are victims uh, to society leaving them behind. Um, I want to tell you about two of them today. Um, these two students and the other nine that I, or the other seven that I'm speaking about, they needed wraparound services, and they don't get them. They need social workers, they need counselors, they need nurses, uh, healthcare professionals. Um, they need a lot of the things that our students are not getting. Um, the first one is Tykees. Tykees was caught with marijuana in school. He was suspended, and he was waiting his panel hearing. Uh, in those three months that he was waiting for a panel hearing in which he was out of school, um, he tagged along with his two older brothers to an arms robbery. His older eldest brother killed the clerk at the store. Tykees was part of that, and because of that reason, he was arrested as an accessory. Um, he was 15 at the time. My other student that I want to tell you about falls on the other end of the spectrum. His name was James. 
He was a running back. He loved to show me his highlights when he played football and everything. Um, he actually was uh, able to graduate high school. When he graduated, a year later, he was killed in front of a movie theater. The reason I bring both of these students up specifically is because you kind of see both ends of the spectrum, where one commits a homicide, the other one is killed. Yet again, for me, both of these students and all of my students are victims to a society that has completely left them behind and that has decided that they are not worth the humanity that uh, they are worth. Um, I believe in HP 1316. Uh, I think if you all truly care about our students, if you all truly care about our youth, then you will support this bill. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Meg Clark. I'm a parent of a Chesterfield County student and a Chesterfield County teacher. I'm here to tell you about a story about a boy named Robert who is a middle school student. Last year, Robert, who is on the spectrum, was fighting feelings of depression and issues with um, low self-worth. One day last year on the bus, he found himself, um, a student next to him was talking to him and was hearing him talk about um, situations where he was feeling he was going to end his life. The student reported it to the school. The school failed to report it to the parents. The following day, Robert's parents met with the administration. Their question was, what is protocol in a situation like this? The frightening answer was they were told it depended on the day. And I ask you, what does that mean? Protocol is something that is set up for our teachers and our administrators in a situation like this. But what happens when our schools are understaffed? What happens when a guidance counselor is only available every other day or a nurse is in school only once a week? What happens when a classroom is too large or has five ESL students and no ESL assistant? Or a strain because many kids in the school don't have a meal that morning and the teacher is called on for extra support? I ask you, does a teacher have the time and resources to report concerns about Robert's bad day to the guidance department? If she does find the time, is there a guidance counselor on staff that day to help Robert? If she has time to consider Robert's midday medication needs, does she have time to make sure she re he received them because there is not a nurse on staff that day? If she fails in any of these respects, if Robert's parents are not alerted and if Robert doesn't get help, we have failed and sometimes that failure is catastrophic. There are dozens and dozens more stories that illustrate the challenges we are presented when inadequately funding our schools. Inadequate funding means deteriorating buildings, lack of supplies, transportation concerns, safety risk, and the, other, and the one primary focus is of our bill of inadequate staffing. This is a system failure based on lack of funds, and if we continue to neglect our schools, we will be faced with catastrophic consequences of which we will fail to recover. Thank you very much. So I'm going to jump in right here real quick. Um, I could talk about this all day, and I actually do. Um, but we don't have the time to do that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to cut the line off with the four people who are in the front. I'm going to play bad cop, unfortunately. Uh, all of you all in the back, you know where to find us. Um, for the advoc teacher advocates who are here, I apologize, but, but we also have to get through school counselors, and we have to get through librarians, and, and we, we're going to run out of time if we don't do that. So I'm going to play bad cop. I apologize. If, for more stories, please feel free to share with us via email. I mean, this is just the beginning of this process. It's not, it's not the end. And so um, let's try to keep it to one minute for the last four. Good morning. My name is Mary Gresham, and I'm here as both a parent of four students who attend public schools in Richmond and a 34-year employee in Richmond Public Schools. I support HB 1316 because it provides additional, much-needed funding for at-risk students. Having two sons with various exceptionalities, this bill would afford them additional resources. HB 1316 would allow school districts funding for needed support positions like additional counselors, school social workers, and a school nurse in every school building. I ask you to also support and vote for HB 1316 so that resources can be provided to every student in every zip code. Thank you. Good morning. I am Asia Good, and I'm a junior at Open High School. I'm sure that you are aware of the impact that Richmond Public Schools staff, such as social workers, school nurses, and psychologists have on students. They're the healing and guiding forces that help children enact their hopes and dreams. 
When Richmond parents send their children to school, they're not only trusting RPS with them, but hoping that they're able to positively help shape their futures. Unfortunately, RPS, in its current state, is not properly doing these things. Caseloads for these positions in RPS exceed the suggested amount by hundreds. The average student caseload for school counselors in Virginia has grown from a 300 to a whopping 360 in simply a decade. Not to mention that some schools reach more than 1,000 students per counselor. In addition to that, the state of Virginia only funds one teacher for every 59 English learner students. The effects of underfunded and understaffed schools are apparent in failing SOL scores, disciplinary incidents within schools, low attendance, and graduation rates. To combat these things, we are here demanding that the state increase staffing for specialized student support, school counselors, assistant principals, English learner teachers, reading specialists, and elementary school principals, as suggested in HB 1316 code provisions. Thank you. Hi, my name is Melody Kelly, and I'm a junior at Richmond Community High School. I attend Richmond Public Schools where the quality of my education is contingent upon my zip code. I attend Richmond Public Schools where the tile on the ceiling is covered with mildew from leaks that should have been fixed months ago. I attend Richmond Public Schools where classrooms are freezing in the winter and boiling in the summer. I attend Richmond Public Schools where some of our own teachers are coming out of their pocket to ensure that we get the best education within arm's reach. I attend Richmond Public Schools where we have part-time nurses and, and guidance counselors that have as many as a thousand students to assist. I attend Richmond Public Schools where we have to rally in order to get adequate funding. Students like myself shouldn't have to rally for what we need. But since we have the voice, why not use it? We want to see 100% passing rates on SOLs, and we want to see accredited schools, but we aren't given the proper tools to do so. This is a setup. How are we expected to lead the city when the environment in which we learn isn't setting us up for success, but rather failure? Thank you. Good morning. I'm Courtney Austin, a teacher at Cool Spring Elementary in Petersburg, Virginia. Um, one thing I want to say is that equity we know means that everyone need, gets what they need to be successful. Our students are not awarded this opportunity because we are so lowly funded. We have so many kids coming in with various adverse childhood experiences that we as teachers cannot address. Our counselors are overloaded. Our principals are overloaded. Everyone is overloaded, but our pockets, the funding is not being funneled to where it needs to be. We have so many, so many teachers that are walking out of the profession because we cannot meet those needs. Just as the students have said, all the educators want to say the same thing. We ask that you please, please fund this bill. Thank you. And, and since I cut many of you off, why don't we just do, uh, if, you, if you support this bill, if you came here to support it, why stand so we can see everybody that came to support the bill? Thank you. Um, all right, does anybody here want to speak in opposition to the bill? <laughs> I said to David Bul to Delegate Bulova, who's against public schools? Um, so that was almost like a trick question, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> uh, so, so I'll kind of put my two cents in here. You know, when I started teaching 15 years ago, it was right before the recession hit. And, and when it did hit, it had a very devastating impact on public schools, as everybody in this room knows. And uh, one of the main reasons why I ran a couple years ago for this seat was because I had not thought that we had done enough. And I think that you know, over the last two years, we started to really get in the game. And I think the governor's budget with the ELL and school counselors and some other things has really pushed the ball forward. But I want to thank Delegate Aird, and I want to thank the board for really being leaders and getting us where we, where we need to go, right? Where we know we need to be to make sure that we are um, truly educating all children in the Commonwealth. And so, um, you know, to tip my hand, right, I, I'll be supporting this bill. Um, but uh, Delegate Guy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I I'm new up here. That's why I'm down here in the children's table. <laughs> I came here to Richmond to vote for this bill, but what I didn't understand was, and I'm a co-patron, so obviously I'm voting for this bill, and I think everybody on this panel 
may vote for this bill. But your job is not done because what I now understand is no matter how much those of us on education want this, the funding comes from the 22 people in appropriations. So even if it's not read for Ed Day, I suggest you all come back en masse and tell them this is the most important thing we fund. Thank you. Delegate Robinson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> I, in concept, I love this bill. I think the board did a great job as far as their um, work and fund. And, but my concern is the funding because it's two hundred and seventy million dollars, enough statewide to make a big enough difference. Is my first my first concern because I think originally the number that was thrown out was something over a billion dollars, um, and so. How are we picking and choosing, number one? And, and, and I, 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 I like the whole equity thing, and I do think that, you know, our, our kids in, in that need the most should, should definitely see a lot of this. But my biggest concern with all of this and, and this bill, and why I probably am going to vote no on this bill, is do we have the people in the workforce to, to fill these positions, and we're putting a mandate on our school systems <clears throat> to have to do this, and I'm just not sure we have the workforce to, to do it. And, and so that's my big concern with this bill. And, um, and expanding out the workforce, the teacher pay raises, everything else, it, it really still comes down to a big funding issue for me. So it's not that I don't support this in concept. I love the idea that we're finally doing something and we're updating and we're gonna head in the right direction, but I have some really big concerns. Delegate Guzman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would like to start by thanking the patron for uh, carrying this bill and for the people who came today to testify and to bring awareness to the committee members and the Virginia Assembly, the amount of scarcity in resources that we have in public schools across this state. I would say that it might, it's gonna be a long battle but I just want each one of you to know that we will continue to fight to provide with you the resources that you need. In the last remarks, when we talk about what if we don't have enough resources, I just can't put up with what ifs anymore. It is that we have the resources across this country and Virginia provides the highest paying jobs in the country as well. And I hope that in one day, we will be the state who will drive the, the resources from this country to come to Virginia, where we provide the best public education in the country. I will conclude my remarks by saying that continue to fight, continue to bring awareness. Thank you for coming here today and traveling from wherever you came from, and also, to apologize for not making on this assembly public education a priority since 2008. We are hoping that we are making a difference now, starting 2018, but this fight is not over. Thank you so much for coming here today. This committee works on motions. Chairman. Delegate Bolivar. Move to report and refer to appropriations. Second. There's been a motion to report and refer to appropriations, House Bill 1316, uh, it was properly seconded. Members will record their vote on the electronic voting system. Clerk will close the roll. Uh, that has been reported and referred to appropriations on a vote of seven to one. Thank I thank the committee. Aaron. All right, Delegate McQuinn uh, for House Bill 1508. Good morning, uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Um, I'm bringing before you again House Bill 1508 that changes the school counselor staffing ratio. Mr. Chair and members of the committee, uh, this bill proposes to change the standards of quality for school counselor ratio to reach the national recognized best practices level, best practice level, one counselor per 250 students at every grade level beginning in FY22, uh, the 20, the 21, 
into 22 school year. As a result of the General Assembly action in 2019, the code currently states that the standard of quality ratio is 1 to 375 for elementary level, 1 to 325 for middle school, and 1 to 300 for high school. However, the ratio was superseded by budget language and funds for an even higher ratio, which is currently required and funded at uh, 1 to 455 for elementary school, 1 to 375 for middle school, and 1 to 325 for high school. And so this bill proposes to phase in the 1 to 250 ratio over the biannual. In the 2021 school year, the ratio will be funded at 78. $1 million in FY22, and it's in the governor's budget to meet the current code language. And that is 1 to 375 for elementary, 1 to 325 for middle school, and 1 to 300 for high school. And then in the second year, the school year, uh, this bill will require 1 to 250 ratio at all grade level. And there's additional dollars to help address that. But why are we here and why are we talking about or asking for funds and to make sure that we are providing the necessary resources to address this issue? We know how important school counselors are. They are very, very important. We know there's also a shortage and uh, there have been many conversations about that. But we have credentialed and licensed school counselors living in Virginia. They may not be working in the road, but they are living here. And as of 2018 data, there are approximately 640 counselors current working in Virginia schools in other roles, and another 2,390 who have a valid counselor's license but are not employed by the Virginia public schools. So obviously, not all will come back to this profession, but there is some untapped supply that exists in Virginia. These are critical times for our young people, and whether they are educators, a teacher that we need, or guidance counselors, or bus drivers, we know that we need the necessary human resources as well as financial resources to begin to help address this shortage in our school system so that our kids are met and provided with social, emotional, and mental health support to students and by in, in, in ensuring that their well-being and their safety are addressed. And so, Mr. Chairman, I'm hoping that as we look at this particular issue, that we could favorably vote upon it, realizing that uh, school counselors, once again, are, are a major and important uh, resource in our school system, providing, as they've always, academic, career planning, social, and emotional development support uh, to our young people. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Before we open it up for questions, um, we need to incorporate House Bill 398 into this very fine House Bill 1508. So can I get Thank a you. motion to incorporate 398 into 1508? Second. Uh, there's been a motion and a second. This is a voice vote. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? All right, so House Bill 398 has been incorporated into 1508, uh, and Delegate Marshall. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, back in 2018, we had a select committee on school safety, Delegate Robertson, and I was vice chair of that. Uh, and one of the things we heard about this particular issue is that uh, we had uh, testimony from school counselors, and what we heard around the state was school counselors were not being school counselors. They were having to do other jobs. Mm -hmm. And so in 2019, we put a bill in to, uh, to make school counselors school counselors and added extra funding. So my question is, is do we need language in here, if we're going to pass this bill, that we make the school system do what they, we ask them to do? Do we, Mr. Chair? Mr. Chair. Delegate Quinn. Yes. Quinn. Uh, let me ask uh, that um, Secretary Kwan is here as well as a deputy of secretary, if they could come forward. If, and, and I would agree that, Mr. Chair. The what, chairman the, says that he thinks we're good. Yes, okay. Mr. Chairman. Do you want to Delegate Bulova. Yeah, yeah. And, and uh, thank you, Delegate Marshall, for jogging our memories on that, because I think that was probably one of the critical things we did last year was in, ensuring, again, that our counselors were actually engaging in counseling work. And I think that the minimum was at least 80 percent 
um, that, that they had to spend on counseling work and uh, that was in the law, so um, I think that would still stand and apply to any any new ratios, and perhaps okay. Secretary Carney can confirm right. Mr. that. Chairman, that is accurate because we did, if, you, if you're referring to the 80-20, that is duplicative, so uh, it's okay if it's in the bill, uh, but it's already in code. Okay. All right. Thank you. Delegate Guy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Delegate McQuinn, I'm correct in thinking that this portion of the SOQ revision is funded in the governor's budget, correct? Yes. Thank you. This already has money. <laughs> uh, are there people who here, I assume, I would imagine there are, who would like to speak in favor of the bill? Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good to see you again. Uh, good morning, members of the committee. Uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, Derek and McQuinn for championing this, uh, not just this year, but in, for several years. And... We finally made some headway uh, starting last year, and we need to finish the job uh, this year. I'm here on behalf of the governor um, and the Northam administration supporting uh, 1508. It is uh, one of the governor's bills. Uh, it is in his proposed budget, but as we all know, nothing is guaranteed. I am certain that this committee is favorable to this bill and will refer it to the House Appropriations. But the, two, the one counselor per 250 students at every grade level is the national, nationally recognized best practice. It is the gold standard. Uh, the effort, again, was initiated by the governor and the General Assembly last year. We have to finish the job this year uh, to make a meaningful difference in the lives of our students. As you all are well aware that school counselors play a critical role in supporting students' academic and career readiness, but also their social and emotional well-being. Uh, research is clear. And there's a lot of research. Here's the research that this 1 to 250 ratio leads to lower disciplinary rates, improved ability to successfully navigate the high school to career pipeline, improve student attendance, and improve high, high, higher, gradu uh, higher graduation rates. <clears throat> the effects of this are particularly strong for students who are economically dis disadvantaged. And unfortunately, I just want to be very forthright that Virginia has been headed in the wrong direction. Over the last decade, counselor ratios have increased by an average of 85 students per counselor, and the students they serve are more frequently coming from economically disadvantaged families. As the population of students who stand to benefit the most from these services, um, we have to ask, we've asked more of our counselors. Uh, that's why last year we took the steps that we did. This legislation will get us the rest of the way, and folks who argue that we are not going to be able to find enough licensed school counselors, and we have a workforce issue. That is just not accurate. Our data clearly shows that there are ample amount of licensed school counselors who can serve both the social, emotional, and the academic and career needs of our students right here in the Commonwealth, and we will definitely be able to, in the next two years, get to the gold standard if you uh, continue the ball rolling and pass this up to the House Appropriations Committee. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. And in my role of being a broken record, please just, everybody in line, keep your remarks as brief as possible. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. My name is Jim Livingston. I'm president of the Virginia Education Association. I want to thank the uh, Board of Education for addressing this issue and bringing us up to what we consider the gold standard. I also want to thank the governor for including this recommendation in his budget. But most especially, I want to thank Delegate McQuinn, who has worked alongside with us for many years on this critical issue. The 40,000-plus members of the Virginia Education Association stand in full support of this bill. Good morning, members of the committee. My name is Brett Welch. I am the Advocacy and Government Relations Chair for the Virginia School Counselor Association and also a school counselor in Henrico. Um, thank you so much, Delegate McQuinn, for your support of this, uh, for putting this up. Everyone has said a lot of what I was going to say, so I will only say um, that we are in full support of the bill. Uh, a lot of the data that you've heard about ratios, current ratios, I want you to know that they're minimums, not maximums. So that would mean that there would be a minimum of a school counselor for 375 students. 
The maximum, though, in the reality is that there are a lot more right now. So the difference that this bill would make is that it would be a maximum, and written in the language, it would be no more than 300 students to a school counselor. That's what's really going to make the difference. And when we're talking about staffing, uh, Secretary Carney said it beautifully, we do have enough people to staff this position, even in rural areas. And as an association, we are thinking about how to staff those positions and uh, use it working with graduate schools to create more programs online, things, certificates, and that kind of thing. So no, that is also coming down the line. Uh, this position really is not interchangeable with social workers, sc school psychologists, uh, behavior counselors. They have really different roles and different jobs. So a school counselor is uniquely trained to do the academic, the social, emotional, and the post-secondary. So thank you so much. Hi, good morning. My name is Emma Clark. I am a former teacher from Richmond and a current teacher in Chesterfield. Um, and I wanted to say that, you know, we're, as teachers, we're really resistant to the term teacher shortage just because we know that it's not a shortage of people. Um, it's really a shortage of positions um, and positions that people can get paid enough at to really build their life on. Um, as for the, the schools that I've worked in, I have a lot of kids whose behavior issues are a result of trauma that they've experienced. And so as a teacher, if I have a kid who's acting out and I want to refer them to the administration to have that handled, what I really want and what the kid really needs is a counselor to do a restorative justice circle or to do some kind of trauma-informed care, some counseling, some support. What I often get is a suspension. Um, and that makes me hesitant to even ask for that support because I know that I'm hurting the kid further rather than helping them if they get the suspension. But that's all that there's the time and resources to do sometimes. Um, and so it's exacerbating the school to prison pipeline. It's preventing us from being able to nurture our children. Um, and so I really urge that you guys support this, and I urge that you support it regardless of whether or not you think that there's enough funding for it, because we'll determine that later through the, the money committees. Um, and to just reiterate um, what um, Delegate Guzman was saying, um, we live in the 10th wealthiest state in the, in the country. Um, our highest income tax bracket starts at 17000 a year. We have loopholes in our tax system for people who have yachts who can write them off as a second home. Um, we have all sorts of tax credits. We allow corporations to not pay the same tax rate as Main Street small businesses. Uh, we have not raised the corporate tax rate in over 40 years. So the money is there. And for us to hear we care but, but you know, wish we could, there's just not enough money, is not an acceptable answer from the people who are in charge of raising the money. Okay, um, the line seems to be getting longer. So uh, if you're... <laughs> If you're after Chris, which means you're not the next two people, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you to contact folks later because, once again, we're at the beginning of the process, not the end of the process, and we're on only our second of 20 bills, and we only have an hour left. Um, so um, if the last two people could go, thank you. Good morning. My name is Andy Brower. I'm a first-grade teacher at Broad Rock Elementary. I wanted to talk very quickly about the effect that this bill would have on all the other students in the classroom. As she spoke about, the students who need this help are not getting the counseling that they need. They're getting disciplinary action. But in a first grade class like mine, every time a student needs help, if that student cannot get a counselor or appropriate behavior help right away, the rest of the class will fall apart. It's so difficult to deal with a student who needs social and emotional counseling while trying to teach the rest of the students. And if you can imagine a bunch of six-year-olds, they're going to want to know what's going on with the boy or the girl that's in the corner talking to the teacher. So it's so important for the rest of the students to be able to get this, count that, so that the affected students get this counseling so the rest of the students in the classroom can um, continue working. Also, the school counselors provide social and emotional support support to the teachers as well. And that's another reason that teachers are leaving, because they don't have the people to look after them. That's why this bill is so important. Hello, good morning. Chris Dunk, I'm with the Commonwealth Institute. We are in strong support of this bill. And I want to, uh, to highlight that the improved academic benefits from having manageable caseloads that have been discussed today about higher graduation rates, um, improvements to school attendance, improvements in school climate and student safety, those studies have focused in on the ratio of 1 to 250. So this is not some number that has just been put out there. This is what the research shows is needed. And this bill will get there by the second year of the budget and is an important piece of legislation. Thank you. Is there anybody here in opposition? Um, so 
I just want to highlight what Delegate Marshall talked about, that being on the select committee, we really honed in on this being one of the key parts to safety. But really, when you're talking about school counselors, you're obviously talking about more than that. And you're talking about the importance of academics. You're talking about the importance of the teacher workload. And, and speakers very eloquently put that. And so having said that, I'm going to entertain a motion. There's been a move to, re to report and refer. There's been a move to report and refer to appropriations, and there's been a second. And so all those members will cast their votes in the electronic voting system. Clerk will close the roll. That bill reports and refers to appropriations on an 8 to 0 vote. Thank you, Thank Delegate Thank you, Mr. McQuinn. Chair and members of the committee. Uh, Delegate Sickles. Uh, before we we do Delegate Sickles 916, uh, the first move is to incorporate House Bill 1110 into House Bill 916. So I would uh, entertain a motion to incorporate House Bill 1110 into House Bill 916. There's uh, been a second. All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed? All right, House Bill 1110 has been incorporated into House Bill 916. Delegate Sickles, take it away. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. I believe there's a substitute. And... And uh, this is an important but much shorter bill than the last two you, you've heard. Its um, title is called a Holocaust Education Bill. The legislation requires the Department of Education in consultation with the Commonwealth's Chief of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion to establish and appoint members of an advisory committee for the purpose of strengthening culturally relevant education practices and supporting anti-bias education in, uh, in response in the Commonwealth. Uh, the advisory committee is to report back to the Board of Education in, on July 1, 2021. So there's a limited scope here. I believe the substitute doesn't have a fiscal impact, but if it, if it still has one, you can send it up to the, to the 13th floor. We'll be happy to look at it up there. Um, unfortunately, our Commonwealth is not exempt from anti-Semitism, hate crimes, and attacks on those who differ from us. Members in the Muslim community, the Sikh community, the African American community, the Latino community, the Indian American community, and more, uh, students must understand the historical connection to current incidents of racism, anti-Semitism, and other forms of harassment and bullying. And despite the increase in hate incidents, we see a lack of information on the history of the symbols and hate words being used. For example, ignorance of the Holocaust is growing. A 2018 survey uh, found that 66% of millennials could not identify what the Auschwitz concentration and death camp was. And I could go further, but I know you're busy, and I think there are people, I'm not sure how many people are here to speak to this bill. It's a simple bill to just recommend to the Board of Education updated SOLs on this subject. Uh, there's been a motion to move the substitute and a second. All those in favor? Aye. All those opposed? All right, the substitute is before us. Uh, all those in favor of the bill that wish to speak? My name is Miriam David Al, and I'm here today to advocate for House Bill 916, a bill that will serve to strengthen and ensure the education we provide to our youth in Virginia, and will give them the tools to navigate in this increasingly unstable world filled with anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, racism, and bigotry of all forms. Ladies and gentlemen, today marks the 75th anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz the notorious Nazi death camp where over 1.1 million Jews were murdered only because of who they were. Men, women, children, gassed and cremated. It may, marks the beginning of the end of World War II and the genocide of six million, including one and a half million children. Jews of Europe, where in Poland alone, over 90% of the entire Jewish population was murdered. I am here today as a member of the board of the Virginia Holocaust Museum, and the Jewish Community Federation of Richmond's Community Relations Committee. I also serve on the State Board of the Virginia Center for Inclusive Communities. I am here today having grown up in the shadow of the Holocaust. You see, my grandfather was deported from Vienna in 1939 to the east and purportedly shot and thrown in a pit somewhere in the Ukraine. My grandmother was murdered by starvation and disease. My mother barely survived her teen years as a slave and incarcerated victim. Their crime? Being Jewish. This is personal. I am here today as an educator and advocate for our youth. I know that Holocaust education provides educators with the opportunity to elevate several important learning objectives, respect for differences, understanding where prejudice can lead, the fragility of democracy and a free press. This is global. 
I am here because we live in an ever-changing world where 55% of people don't know or don't know, believe that Jews died. We have data that tells us that utilizing the Holocaust as a case study with other genocides and human rights education is the best way to fight prejudice and discrimination. And as we've seen a rise in anti-Semitism, 60% over the past few years, we know how important this is. We endorse the work of the commission that can assess the current status of professional development for educators relating to the Holocaust and determine where we can enhance standards to better assure that our students receive quality information about the Holocaust, one of the most effective subjects for examining basic moral issues. Silence and indifference to the suffering of others cannot be tolerated, and viewing today's issues through the lens of the Holocaust will make a difference for today and tomorrow's generation. The Holocaust was not an accident in history. It occurred because individuals, organizations, and governments made choices that not only legalized discrimination, but also allowed prejudice, hatred, and ultimately mass murder to occur. I encourage you to pass House Bill 916 today and in the full committee. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to speak on such an important and timely bill. My name is Claudia Sachs, and I am an activist, the Vice President of Jewish Programming in Virginia for my Jewish youth group, and a junior at Glen Allen High School. I am also a proud member of the Richmond Jewish community. Today I will share two personal stories that demonstrate why we need to strengthen Holocaust and anti-hate education in Virginia. A few years ago, in my history class, my teacher posed the question, what have you learned about the Holocaust? With strange confidence, my classmate responded, I think a thousand people died. The problem here was that Virginia had failed to teach her about the six million Jews who had died in the Holocaust. Two years ago, I saw the thread of Holocaust ignorance continue. In Spanish class, two senior boys were making racist jokes and Holocaust jokes. When I spoke up, one of them told me to take a shower. At first, I was in shock, and I asked what he meant. He looked me right in the eye and said, I meant the showers of the Holocaust. I was outraged, and I was so afraid. I told him that my great-grandmother died in those showers, that the Holocaust should never be turned into a joke. Delegate Van Valkenburg, this incident occurred just three classrooms down from your current classroom. And I've heard other, I've had other experiences, like the boys who were laughing while they drew swastikas on the back of my middle school bus. Other kids have asked me casually if I have a Jewish face or Jew smarts. I would still like to believe that my peers who use those hateful images and spoke those hateful words are not anti-Semites, nor are they Holocaust deniers. My peers were ignorant, and their ignorance is a product of the current lack of education about the Holocaust and discrimination in Virginia public schools. So after experiencing multiple anti-Semitic incidents, I wrote op-eds and editorials in the Richmond Times Dispatch, and I was featured in an NBC 12 news story. I decided to speak out like I'm doing today, but there's only so much I can do on my own. I discussed Holocaust education with my principal, Mr. Davenport, and he was eager to add more Holocaust-related curriculum to our school, but he does not have the power to change Virginia standards. You alone have that power. Holocaust and anti-hate education have been severely neglected in Virginia. At this historic moment, each of you can vote for HB 916 to ensure that all students get the best possible education. The students need to know about what happened in Auschwitz and what happened in Auschwitz 75 years ago. They need to know about the legacy of slavery in Virginia, including the slave auctions that occurred just blocks from this building. 
They need to know about the hate that continued to intensify when white supremacists marched through Charlottesville, shouting, Jews will not replace us. I need to know that all of you and all of the Virginia legislators can look me in the eye and promise to protect me. Protect me from bigotry. Protect me from anti-Semitism. Protect me from hate. Protect me from ignorance by properly educating every student in the Commonwealth of Virginia. Please vote for HB 916. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Uh, I'm Austin Houck, here today representing Homoglobin, a, bush, a group pushing for LGBTQ equality in education and health care. Uh, I came in here in support of HB 1110, which I believe was just incorporated into uh, 916. Um, so I worked with Delegate Hudson to create this bill. Uh, only took a couple of minutes. The changes were really simple. The bill uh, and the incorporated bill seek solely to add the contributions of LGBTQ individuals and the larger queer rights movement into our existing history and civics curricula in our public schools. That's all it is. If this ends up on Governor Northam's desk, we would be just the sixth state in the nation with a law like this on the books, following the lead of states like California and Illinois. As we enter this decade with a new legislature, the most diverse in our state's history, it seems fitting that we should update our old guidelines to reflect the diversity of our country, of all of us. This bill isn't just to recognize the queer people who made and continue to make this country what it is today, though. It's to teach the LGBTQ youth of our state about those that paved the way before them, and hopefully to give them role models in civic activism. Before I was 14 or 15, I didn't even know what being gay was. According to the playground of my elementary school, it meant stupid. My parents never taught me about what it meant and during my teens, when I first realized I was gay, I felt embarrassed and alone with nobody I knew of to look up to in history. And it's crazy to think about because considering that I come from Alexandria, I was and am one of the lucky ones. Fast forward to now and people think things have changed, but they haven't. The same toxic attitudes towards queer people in even early elementary school still remains. Obviously, this incorporated bill doesn't fully address the larger issue of homophobia and transphobia in our public schools. But it does help to normalize being queer as just another part of our history, just as worthy of respect and discussion as every other group. We won't see the effects of this change immediately, but 15, 30 years from now, there will be young queer people that will hear about the struggles faced by their community during the AIDS crisis, the fight for marriage equality, and think to themselves, I'm proud to be the product of their progress. This bill deserves to be read on the House floor, and I really hope you agree with me. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Jim Livingston, the VEA, is proud to support this piece of legislation. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, and anybody that wish to speak in opposition? Mr. Chairman, Todd Gacky with the Family Foundation. We just have some concerns um, with, uh, with both of these bills that have now been um, merged together. Uh, speaking to the uh, anti-hate uh, legislation, which we think is, is great. We want to make sure that we instruct our children um, uh, against, um, against hate, uh, teaching them the values and importance of respecting others. However, in this bill, there is some language with respect to terms like bigotry, uh, dehumanizing injustice, um, terms that are not spelled out in the code and that we know in, in um, our society can be interpreted in different ways. So we want to be, we're concerned that this language could be interpreted by this advisory council in uh, ways that may uh, conflict with uh, family values. Um, for instance, um, it could teach that, um, a a, that marriage between, belief in marriage uh, between one man and one woman would be interpreted as bigotry. And that could create some conflict between the student and the child. Also, with respect to... Um, House Bill 1110, um, we feel like things like sexual orientation, gender identity are, are concepts that are best left um, to families to discuss. And this is also seems to go outside the scope of family life education. Um, and so we want to make sure that, you know, teachers are already having to discuss and, and teach on 
a variety of topics and adding these to SOL curriculums could um, just add to the, to the areas in which they have to speak on um, and, and, you know, adding to their workload. So we would just urge caution on this bill. Thank you. Delegate Robinson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, just to speak to the bill. Um, the original bill that Delegate Sickles um, introduced, I was in full support of. Um, and I had some questions on, on the other bill. Um, and I'm going to vote no on this, not because I'm against this whole concept, but we went from Delegate Sickles' bill and and then Delegate Hudson's bill. Delegate Hudson's bill originally had four words in it. That was the change. And now we have two pages. So um, I'm going to vote no now. Um, that doesn't mean I won't support this in full committee, but I just want to be out there why I'm casting a no vote. Delegate Davis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, similarly, I, when I saw the original bill, I was supportive of the original. I have a little bit of an issue with the combined with the combined bill, um, in kind of similar to what the young lady articulately put, there's so many people today that don't understand the history of the Holocaust and what that meant to a, a, a complete uh, country and, and, and group of individuals. To hear someone think that only 1,000 people died when the number is pushing 6 million. Um, I hate the idea of, of, uh, of diluting the message and what we need to continue to remember and generations need to continue to remember uh, from that uh, it, probably the darkest uh, part of our, of our world's history. Um, we've had uh, dark parts of our countries and our, and our world's history, but I, I think that is far beyond anything else that I think I can think of. Um, and I, uh, I, I was hoping I could support the original. If it finds its way back, I would be supporting the original. I just uh, I don't want to dilute it with a lot of other stuff and have people miss the true history and lesson that we all need to remember from what happened uh, back in, uh, in during that period. Thank you. Delegate Marshall. Yes, this is a question uh, for the uh, patron. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Delegate Sickles, you, you've heard the problems with the substitute uh, your call, would you want to go back to the original bill um, as introduced? Mr. Chairman, I would encourage the members, you've had enough time now during this testimony to read this entire bill, and I think some of the things that have been said are not consistent with the substitute. Uh, and so um, the bill that we're passing is the one before you, the substitute. The, I, and so that's that's how I can answer your question. If you don't it's pretty straightforward. Um, is there a line that you have a problem with that I can answer a question on? It's only 58 lines long, double-spaced. <laughs> so I, I do think that maybe um, you're conflating the issue, but actually, and, and uh, Mr. Chairman, if I may uh, continue, Sickles. um, yep. Delegate Corey reminds me that she has H, uh, HB 483, which, uh, she would like incorporated into this bill as well. Okay. If that's, uh, if that's, uh, yeah, we can have a motion to incorporate 483 so into 916. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed. Okay. So we've done that. Um, speaking to the bill, you know, I, I, it's it's kind of fitting that it's uh, you know International Holocaust Remembrance Day, and, and I think to Delegate Davis's point, you know one of the things that the Jewish Federation of Richmond put out an ad to, in today's paper, and they said you know Holocaust Remembrance Day reminds us that we must always be vigilant of humanity's worst inclinations. However, Hanukkah reminds us that light overcomes darkness just as love overcomes hate, and I think the important thing to note there is that um, there's steps on the way to the Holocaust. And so while I appreciate Delegate Davis's point that, um, that that might be one of the most, the most evil act in the history of, of humankind, it, it didn't get there in a vacuum. There were steps along the way where we saw a rise in hate, we saw a rise in discrimination. And so I think it's important that this commission does look at those things. And so I, I would hope that the committee would pass this bill out. Uh, and if, you know, 
if there are things we need to tweak along the way, that's, that's great. But this is, I think, a, a really important step. In the last year, we've looked at African-American history in the Commonwealth, uh, and we've looked at a lot of the kind of structural um, discrimination that was built into the legal code as well. And I think that this is a next step towards ensuring that our curriculum and our schools are a place where everybody can learn uh, and everybody's histories are told uh, so that you know, we are a commonwealth where, where everybody um, is participating on equal footing. Uh, Delegate Guzman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, speaking to the bill. Delegate Guzman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would concur with you that we are living in an era where just because we don't feel comfortable with words and definition, we are leaving children suffering in the school system. I think that if we are not comfortable with it as members, we should be open-minded and get educated and allow children to get educated as well. As the young lady shared with us before, what she is facing in the school just because of the lack of knowledge and ignorance among students, I don't think that we should postpone anymore bringing this concept and these struggles of many people who currently live in our country and are facing discrimination. So I will be in support of this bill, and I thank Delegate Sickles for bringing it forward. Mr. Chairman. Delegate Bolivar. I have a motion. Um, Delegate Bolivar. Motion to report. Second. There's... Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Report the substitute. There's been a motion to report the substitute for House Bill 916. That motion was properly seconded. Members will record their vote on the electronic voting system. Clerk, clerk will close the roll. That bill reports the substitute five to three. Thank you, Delegate Thank you, Mr. Sickles. Chairman. Enjoy the next 16 bills. And I want to apologize to the teachers for not wearing my red tie today. <laughs> Delegate Sickles, it's good that you said that because we all noticed. <laughs> Delegate Rome, do you want to come up? All right. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and to the members of the subcommittee here. Uh, I'm supposed to be chairing my communication sub as of like right now, so I'm going to be relatively quick. The first um, order of business is just to strike um, HP 1415 which is already done. So we'll move on to HB 1599. This is about the school librarian ratio improvements for K-12 schools. So um, this bill improves the ratio of school librarians to students in elementary, middle, and high schools. It would basically go from what is right now, one part-time for 299 students, one full-time to 300 students, the improved ratio would be to two full-time at 700 students. The current ratio in middle schools right now is at one half-time to 299, one full-time at 300, and two full-time at 1,000. This would improve that to two full-time at 800, three full-time at 1,700. And for high schools right now, it's one half-time to 299, one full-time at 300, and two full-times at 1,000. And this would improve that to two full-time at 900 students, three full-time at 1,800 students. And one of the things that I just want to basically mention here is that since the recession, school librarians have dwindled in number and seen their workloads increase dramatically, which affects retention. And school librarians take on many key roles, and their expertise has a direct effect on the success of students, schools, and overall academic achievement of the school community. Um, and there was a study in Colorado that found that schools that gained a school librarian between 2005 and 2011 tended to have more students with advanced reading scores and such schools overall had students with higher reading scores than schools that lost li librarians or never had adequate librarian staff ratios um, in the first place. And school librarians such as my Manassas Park constituent Rachel Kirkland are a resource for teaching, for teaching staff by assisting with lesson planning, research methods, information technology, and focusing on school projects in order to address specific needs within the school. Their role is crucial for student literacy and different programs that they put in place to accelerate student comprehension. This bill would ensure more school librarians throughout the Commonwealth um, or this would, I'm sorry, this bill would ensure more school librarians throughout the Commonwealth to help Virginia students succeed each and every day. Now, there's one issue I want to uh, basically mention with this is that we had conflicting numbers that just recently came out. We had one Department of Education estimate um, for the bill here of what the budget impact would be. So we had to put in 
uh, an 80.1 into the 82.8 million dollar budget request that was for year one and year two respectively but then just this friday we also received a fiscal impact statement from the department of planning and budget that came at 13.9 million for the first year and 14.7 million for year two that's about almost a 70 million dollar goal so what i would just like to do is basically um we've got some folks from across the state here who came to testify today i would love to make sure that they can you know address why this is important and if we can continue this to 2021 so we can iron out um, the deficiency here as well as address some of the issues that came up from the school board association that'd be great how many people are here to testify no okay okay so then uh, mr. chairman yep Delgado Bilbo. I would move that we carry uh, the bill over um, to 2021 under rule 22 there's been a motion to carry over and a second to continue House Bill 1599 to the 2021 session. All in favor will vote aye. Aye. Opposed? House Bill 1599 is carried over. Pat, uh, Delegate Hope. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the subcommittee. House Bill 332. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, House Bill 332 is a culmination of several years of advocacy uh, by parents with a goal to better identify children with dyslexia early, early. What we're trying to do is have early and accurate diagnosis. For years, parents have struggled to get their kids the interventions needed to deal with trouble reading. The problem is, in most cases, by the time they figure it out, precious years have been wasted, and it's very expensive and hard to catch up. The parents are here today. They're asking. They're demanding that Virginia utilize a tool that we know that works in other places that will diagnose dyslexia early because the current use tool that's being used called PALS is insufficient to catch all the kids that are struggling with reading. Last year, the General Assembly, aware of this, directed the Department of Education to conduct a study and make recommendations for a new diagnosis tool. The study made the recommendations and they noted that there are deficiencies with the current tool that's being used and they recommended a pilot to create a new screener. I'm here today to create that urgent sense of urgency with, with this piece of legislation. What House Bill 332, and we do have a substitute, which we can we move in a second, creates a new two-year pilot to test a tool that will better identify struggling readers early so that we can provide them the right interventions. We know that there are two key skills to being a good reader phonological and rapid automotive naming. We only screen for phonological right now, not for the rapid automotive naming. What we're trying to do with this pilot is to include that part of it. This two-year pilot will call for the creation and testing of a new screener that will encompass all of these things. As you all know, literacy is an equity issue, and the question of literacy is an attribute that contributes specifically to the school-to-prison pipeline. I know that there is uh, support from Decoding Dyslexia Virginia and NAACP Virginia are also in strong support of this legislation. They're here to testify. If you approve the language of this bill, then we, this would go up to appropriation. The cost of this pilot to develop this screening tool is only $1.2 million per year. And I think it's important that we do it. If we do nothing, we are culpable for letting these students slip through the cracks and not early diagnose and, and, and intervene in their diagnosis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Delegate Davis. Thank you. Um, Delegate, I, I appreciate you bringing this bill back. I think a lot of us, when we saw the evidence and numbers last year, knew that something needed to be done, and I wish it had kind of gone a quicker route. Um, I'm, obviously, I don't think it's a surprise to many of us the um, what came back. But just a question, I mean, so this is a two-year pilot. It looks like it's one, um, uh, I guess, one school in each of the uh, superintendent districts, uh, each of the eight superintendents' regions, I guess. Is, and maybe the answer is money, but is there any reason why we just can't get this out there? I mean, we know what the answer is. The community knows what the answer is. I b appreciate you championing this, but, have, I mean, what walls have you hit that are preventing us from actually just putting something in there so all students can be helped and we don't have students go through the cracks for the next two years? Mr. Chairman, if I, if I can address that, you know, I, I, think, I think the answer is the resources. You could have a statewide pilot, and the statewide costs are much more expensive than what our goal is here. 
I represent Arlington County. Arlington County is already doing this. Fairfax is starting with a different model from the PALS model that's being used. Henrico is using a different model. A lot of different jurisdictions are already looking to incorporate the two aspects that we're trying to do here, but you've got to test it first. And we don't have the funding to do statewide. I'd love to do it statewide. In fact, that was the original bill. This substitute brings it down because I think it's more important that we do something than wait another year. This has been percolating for a number of years, and we haven't gotten any further. Thank you, Delegate. Delegate Bolivar. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, and Delegate Hope, I'm just trying to make sure I understand how the amendments are operating. And so if, if I understand that the, the language in there that would expand this statewide remains, it would just delay it until 2022, uh, and that we got the pilot program in the meanwhile. Uh, and I guess, if the, I guess the purpose of a pilot is to make sure something is working. Uh, but if, if we don't like the results of the pilot, I guess it would be now incumbent upon us to un unroll this. Is that my understanding? Well, uh, that's a good point, uh, Mr. Chairman. That's a good point, Delegate Bulova. And, and what uh, we could do is put in a reenactment clause in there after those two years uh, to, to come back here and make this thing go mm -hmm. statewide. Okay. And I'd be happy with, with if that was a friendly amendment. Mr. Uh, yeah. So, so – to that point, I'm hesitant to do that on the on the fly right now when we still have 10 bills up. So if we want to go that route, can we pass it by for the week? I get, I don't know. Actually, no, we can't. We can't, can we? Would, would that be okay? so that we can get through this docket and come back with that ready to go? I have two people that have come up from Arlington, if you could hear their testimony. Sure. Mr. Chairman? Yeah. But is that, is that okay? Is that If it doesn't jeopardize my, my bill, I, I'm certainly fine with, with doing that. I, I'm not trying to jeopardize your bill. No, I know that you're not, Mr. <laughs> Chairman. And so I'm, I'm happy to do that. Okay. If they would like to come speak real quick. Yeah. yeah, let's, yeah, go ahead. I'll move, I'll move the amendments. Second. All those in favor of the amendments? Aye. Opposed? Okay. Uh, those who have came to speak in favor of the bill? If we can please be as brief as possible. Hi, I'm Simone Walker. I'm, I'm here on behalf of the NAACP, and I'm also a parent with a child with dyslexia. As you know, literacy is one of our most important civil rights, and the ability to read is the equity issue of our time. This is a top priority for the NAACP. This bill addresses education equity by leveling the literacy playing field. African American and Hispanic students suffer disproportionately when not taught to read using evidence-based practices based on the science of reading. One in six children who are not reading proficiently in third grade does not graduate from high school on time. Overall, though, Virginia's children are being left behind in literacy. The nation's report card has our reading pass rates in the 30th percentile. SOL reading scores, which is the floor for competency and not the ceiling, has declined three years in a row. This rapid automatized naming test that we need takes five to 10 minutes per student, which requires no additional staff, as well as structured literacy. These are the tools that our superintendents need to ensure that none of their students are left behind and that reading is being taught in an equitable way. These numbers represent a lot more than just those students with dyslexia. My son is an eighth grader, was recently diagnosed with dyslexia, and is barely reading above a third grade level despite passing the state's current reading assessment, despite struggling to read since kindergarten. He never got a rapid naming test, nor did he get structured literacy instruction, and he is representative of so many students. This bill will, will drastically reduce the need for special education and reading for so many students and save the state and districts millions of dollars in costly remediations later on. Even VDOE agrees, along with three decades of research, that rapid naming and structured literacy are critical for reading proficiency. And to not deliver this to our students amounts to educational malpractice. Thank you. Hi, thank you for letting me speak this morning. My name is Sherry Height. I'm an educator, a parent of two dyslexic sons, and a graduate student set to graduate in May with my Master's of Education in Reading and a Dyslexia Therapy Endorsement from the University of Central Arkansas. 
Based on my unique experience, I truly believe that adding a simple, normed, rapid, automatized naming screener to our state's early identification process would have given both of my son's teachers and administrators additional information as to why they were struggling to learn to read, write, and spell. Over the last six years, as a PAL support specialist in Virginia Beach City, I have screened over 2,400 kindergartners, first, second, and third graders. A critical missing piece in planning intervention is identifying which students need extra time to recall and practice skills. Assessing a student's rapid, automatized naming skills makes identification possible. This identification enables specialists and classroom teachers to more, more effectively group students together. Unfortunately, our current screener does not give us enough information about a student to do this effectively and efficiently. We need to assess our students' rapid, automatized naming skills so we can accommodate our students to allow additional time for learning and recalling. A RAN assessment is the best predictor for future reading success. This is important for principals, parents, superintendents, and teachers to have the tools in order to be effective and put research into practice. I hope my knowledge as a PAL screener of the PAL screener and its limitations will convince you to vote yes for House Bill 332. All students have the right to read. We cannot continue along the same path with minimal adjustment and expect different results. We must commit now to create the necessary changes to our early screening, intervention, and instructional processes. Your decision today impacts children's lives. Please support House Bill 332. Thank you. Thank you. Delegate Bulova. Mr. Chairman, I would move that we pass by for the day. Uh, the, there's been a motion and a second to uh, pass House Bill 332 by for the day. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Right, that bill passes by for the day, and we'll Thank see you next week. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Delegate Mugler. This is House Bill 233. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee. I present uh, this morning House Bill 233 with the line amendment. I get somebody to move that amendment. Move There's been a motion and a second to move the line amendment. All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed? All right, the bill is amended as before us. Thank Delegate you. Delegate Mugler. House Bill 233, teacher compensation at or above the national average. The bill requires a biennial review of teacher compensation and calls for public school teachers to be compensated at a rate that is competitive in order to attract and keep highly qualified teachers in the Commonwealth. State funding shall be provided in an incremental basis pursuant to the General Appropriation Act to fully implement the provisions by July of 2025. Uh, the NEA reports that a uh, United States average public school teacher making a salary of 60477 in 2017-18. SOQ funded salary for teachers in the governor's introduced budget is 51371 uh, for elementary teachers and 53777 for secondary teachers. Uh, there was a study done in... Um, uh, my locality by the United Way, um, where they gauged financial hardship um, and, and uh, took a look at the living wage in our community. Um, a teacher in their fifth year of teaching who is a single parent with two children would qualify for um, low to no income health insurance. And so it would be, they would be better off to, um, to take free and charitable clinic uh, coverage rather than their coverage through, um, through their employer. Virginia ranks eighth in the nation for, for pre-K public 12 education and 32nd in the, in the nation for average teacher pay. This bill has bipartisan support and will go a long way in creating a state that truly invests in public education. Funding of this magnitude puts First, our children, by appropriately compensating the teachers that teach them. It is as simple as that. No matter where you are on the political spectrum, Mayor Pete said it well in December when he said, and I quote, we should treat our teachers like soldiers and pay them like doctors. 
I respectfully request that this subcommittee look favorably upon House Bill 233 with line amendment and report it to the full Committee on Education. Delegate Marshall. Yes, uh, good morning. Good so morning. My problem with the bill is that one size doesn't fit all. And so the cost of living in some parts of the state are certainly different than they are in other parts of the state. So my thing, my problem with this bill is I think you're going to have an unintended consequence that uh, in areas that uh, my part of the state, average house sale is 125000 bucks. You go to Loudoun County, it's $600,000. It's probably a lot more in your area. So I think the unintended consequences is you could have a migration of teachers from one area to another area because if you go to a an average pay for the whole state, that cost of living in certain parts of the state would be, uh, that money would go a lot further. So that's why I'll vote no. Well, we're currently having a migration of teachers from the Commonwealth to other states who are paying much more. Our neighboring state of Maryland and Pennsylvania. Delegate Davis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So just out of curiosity on this, we want to, so we have to pay teachers above the national average. Does that mean that our average has to be above the national average? That means that we, I'd like to see us be at or above the national average. We're currently below the national average. Mr. Chairman, follow up with me. Delegate Davis. But when you do the calculation that you have in your legislation, what is, how do we know we're meeting that? Does it have to be that our average pay for a teacher has to be above or at the national average? Is that how we're doing it? Our average versus national average? Correct. Our average pay. Okay. Mr. Chairman, if I may speak to Bill. Delegate Davis. Seconds. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I, I, I laud what this is trying to do, and, and we're going to be pushing for more money in the budget for teachers. Uh, we can't afford to have an excess of our, our best and brightest. Um, but at the same time, my concern is almost similar to um, uh, what the prior delegate mentioned, but the average pay for a teacher in Northern Virginia is a lot higher than some other areas. Additionally, there's a local part of this equation that the locality covers as well. So if we say that our average teacher compared to the national average, even if we get to that point, we still may be leaving behind a lot of teachers in other parts of the state uh, because Northern Virginia, maybe my area in Hampton Roads, um, skews that average that we are at the national average, but these teachers still aren't where they need to be. Um, so I, I kind of push back on, on feel-good legislation uh, because I think we need to be that rising tide that lifts all ships. So that's why I'm, I have concerns with this, Mr. Chairman. Delegate Robinson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> and I guess this could be for the patron. Um, it's a question that I have. At the retreat for appropriations back in November, one of the things came up, there were three different numbers to calculate what that average is. The, the NEA has a number, the state calculates as there's a number, and then there's another number out there. And, and that number is... Oops, sorry. And that number is calculated using different people included, benefits, um, support staff. So there's no, what bothers me about this bill is it says like, yeah, we're going we're gonna to do this. And I think that was the path that we've, we've been on is to how we get there and doing it incrementally. Um, but I'd like to see somebody come up with that funding formula. Who is included in that in, in that when we're talking about this? Is it just the teacher in the classroom? Is it all the support staff as well? And that's why I, I struggle with this legislation. Are people who are here to speak in favor of the bill? Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, Kathy Bircher with the Virginia Education Association. I wanted to address a couple of things. The language at or above the national average was actually added unanimously by the General Assembly in 2017. Um, we worked with Delegate Tyler to patron that legislation. Um, again, it passed both bodies unanimously, and that's how it is in code. Um, so that's an important figure. Uh, we appreciate every effort that Delegate Mugler is making. Um, when the governor was elected, he came to us and said, give us a plan to get teacher salaries to the national average. Our plan included year to year 
um, dollars, state dollars for salaries for SOQ funded position, but recognizing that state dollars for salaries oftentimes leave our school divisions the most in need of salary adjustments behind because they're not able to pick up the local share uh, to address some of the concerns. So the second part of our equation was additional state dollars to offset the costs that the localities are picking up for some of the programs and positions that our students need. And we heard that testimony during House Bill 1316 and frankly also lifting the support staff cap. So as we look at overall state funding being still more than 8% behind where we were in 20, 2008, um, we need to shift additional state dollars to offset the localities, the burden they're picking up, while continuing to put state dollars towards salary. Um, the VEA believes very strongly that if the state doesn't put dollars for salaries every year in the budget, localities will absolutely not be able to make those adjustments necessary, but we also need the, the release of the burden that we're putting our localities by shifting additional state dollars for other programs. So we appreciate Delegate Muggler's approach, and we are glad to finally see a real effort. Um, when that bill passed in 2017, I had multiple questions, as did Delegate Tyler of, and this is, and I think they were rhetorical, I know they were, because the questions were, this is aspirational, right? We don't have to fund it. So we encourage you to actually fund the action you took in 2017. Delegate Marshall, yeah. question. Uh, question. I'm a newbie on this uh, committee, so uh, uh, I'm trying to learn. So the, for you, uh, yes, good morning. Uh, so the average salary, would that be the beginning salary or 10 years into, into the job, or, or how, how would that be calculated? Mr. Chairman, Delegate Marshall, um, the NEA figures, which I appreciate Delegate Robinson, Delegate Robinson bringing up because um, we have a long history at the VEA of supporting the NEA figures, no surprise there. The NEA figures take the national average of teachers and truly those licensed teachers um, and, and establish what is the average salary across whatever state they're looking at. And it is the only of the state figures that actually allows a state to state comparison. So it truly is what are we paying all folks who fit in that category, the NEA dollar, the NEA figure, dividing it by the number of folks who fit in that category and then aligning the states in, in an equally measured component so we can then do a true state to state comparison. So it really is as opposed to what we this, the Department of Education does, which is a linear weighted average, which creates a very different number. Um, plus they throw in some other things, including um, some compensation for coaching and um, other, other stipends. Um, so it would be the national, it would be the average salary of, truly the average salary of teachers in the Commonwealth. Follow-up question. Delegate Marshall. So I think I got that. <laughs> and I can, if I, Mr. Chairman, Delegate Marshall, I actually have um, our talking points, and I'm happy to share that with the subcommittee so you can see the, difference, the differences between the three numbers that were mentioned at the House Appropriations Retreat. Happy to send that along. So would it be the same number for, uh, depends on what the teacher teaches? Mr. Chairman, Delegate Marshall, um, it would be the average salary. Um, there's not a differentiation in Virginia among um, if whether, and I used to teach kindergarten and first grade, and folks used to say to me, how much more do high school teachers make? Because that seems harder. Um, I dare those high school teachers. I, uh, my folks behind me, they've gotten that question too. Um, I dare the folks in, in high school to go try a day in kindergarten. Um, we don't <laughs> differentiate between subjects taught. We differentiate between, um, there's, there's generally a jump in the pay scales for years of service. Generally, I will say that that has definitely been um, compressed since 2008, um, and also differentiation on degree. If, if we could be as concise as humanly possible, because we're already not going to finish this docket. Hi, um, I'm Carol Ray, and um, I used to teach in Chesterfield, and um, I had to do the leap to Northern Virginia. For this very reason, I had to leave everything behind. I left my family, my house, um, because I couldn't make it on the salary in Chesterfield County. So I went to Northern Virginia. Um, and yes, the, the housing costs and all the costs are higher. But um, I had to do this because the salaries were not. Um, I had to work three jobs in order to make ends meet on a single income. So um, having those salaries raised would have been helpful. And I understand your point as far as, well, what about it does skew it. But that doesn't mean that having to work in Chesterfield or Henrico or Hanover or the other counties um, should negate the fact. So we all should have it raised 
so that we all could have a, a standard um, of living, that we all could live and not have to work three jobs. Um, I don't know what the answer is as far as having more Virginia skew the rest of the, the state. Um, but I think that with our brilliant minds, I think we could come up with an answer. Um, but we have to raise it because you're going to have more of an exodus out of the teaching field. I've been teaching for 26 years, um, and I had to make that decision so that I could take care of myself when I finally retire. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, Tom Smith, Superintendent Association. Very quickly, we're in support of the bill. Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, Tiffany Finkhanes with the American Federation of Teachers in Virginia. On behalf of our thousands of members, we are in support of this bill and urge you to pass it out of committee. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the subcommittee, Stacey Haney on behalf of the Virginia School Board Association. We also support legislation, and I want to highlight something that Ms. Bircher from the VEA said because it's very important, is that this is only a piece of the puzzle, and so we also need to make sure that, and I know I'm preaching to the choir because this subcommittee has already passed out all this legislation, but we need to make sure that we're also funding the support positions, all those other positions, um, so that the localities can pay, can't afford to pay their share of the teacher salaries. So um, this is one piece of the puzzle. And if, if we only pass this, you're going to impose a real burden on localities. So it's all got to be uh, looked at together and, and all those support pieces as well. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. My name is Vernon Peters. I represent the Virginia Professional Educators, the Independent Teachers Association of the Commonwealth, and we strongly support the bill. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Jennifer Andrews, Henrico County Public Schools. Um, I moved to Henrico County from Chesapeake. When I moved, I took a $5,000 cut that first year. I've been in Henrico for 17 years, so an average of $5,000 loss every year. So yes, Northern Virginia, does, the, the salaries there are higher. So if you take the average if you look at the average teacher salary, and you've got the high end at Henry, in uh, Northern Virginia, and then Hampton Roads, and then Richmond, just think of what the salaries in the rest of the state are, because you've got those three higher areas that are <coughs> offset. The, all the low paying teachers and my friends in the other parts of the state. So I support this bill. Delegate Guzman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, we have a couple of our colleagues that had to go and present other bills. So I would like to ask the patron that we can pass it by temporarily before we report this bill. Is there a second to that? Second. All those in favor of passing by temporarily say aye. 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 Opposed? No. No. <laughs> Nose have it. Um, I would say to this bill that, and to Delegate, Delegate Davis's point, that even if it was a feel-good bill, which I don't think it is, but even if it was a feel-good bill, people weren't talking about this for a long time, and it's a, an incredibly important topic. And so I hope it would be the the, the will of the committee to report and refer it. Um, and Delegate Davis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank you. Um, I, I just want to say I, I appreciate what is trying to be done with this bill. I mean, my answer to what is the right number to pay, it's when we stop losing teachers to the private sector and other states. And it may be well above the national average, but it is what it is. We just can't keep losing our best and our brightest for our mentors for the next generation of teachers. So I, I can appreciate what's being done here. I just think with the language in here, it allows games to get played as they always get played when it comes to finances and things. Um, so that concerns me. And I don't want anyone to walk out of appropriations in two years or whatever, saying we've funded the national average, uh, we're doing well, and we still haven't got to the point where we stop teachers uh, from having to leave the profession. So uh, for that reason, Mr. Chairman, I move that we gently lay this bill on the table. Second. There's been a motion and a second that we gently lay this bill on the table. Um. Mr. Chairman, substitute motion. No. You can. Right. 
<laughs> There's no discussion. Uh, the motion on House Bill 233 is to gently lay this bill on the table. Close the roll. That motion fails. Um, that motion carries. Okay. Close the roll. Right, that motion carries. The bill is laid on the table four to two. Um, real quickly before we move to the next bill, which is going to be Delegate Kilgore, um, we're going to pass three bills by for the day that we will take up next week, and those are House, my own bill, House Bill 272, Delegate Robinson's Bill 1122, Delegate Tran's Bill 1143. So can I get a motion to pass those by for the day, and we will take them up in next week's meeting? So There's been motion and seconded. All those in favor say aye. Opposed? All right, those three bills are by for the day. Uh, for the rest of you that Thank are in you, here. For the, for the rest of you that are in here, we are going to take up Delegate Guzman's bill at 8.50. And so <laughs> between now and 8.50 is the time we've got for the rest of our bills on the docket. Delegate Kilgore, come on up. If, if we don't get to your bill, um, we will do it at next week's docket. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the committee. Uh, what House Bill 86, I brought this at the request of uh, Lee County, which is the uh, lowest uh, composite index uh, county uh, in the state. Uh, and basically what it would allow them to do is expend up to 25% of their required local effort for uh, basic aid for debt service. Uh, we have a problem in Lee County where uh, a lot of the uh, uh, schools are in bad need of repair. Uh, they've attempted uh, a lot of... Uh, uh, a, a lot of ways to uh, repair uh, some of these uh, school buildings and just haven't been able to get that. This would allow the elected uh, school board there to uh, expend up to 25% of that local uh, match uh, uh, for uh, school uh, building capital renovation. So that's basically uh, the bill. Uh, it would, uh, uh, it, there's a couple other school sy systems it might apply to. Uh, that are below uh, 0 0.20, but they didn't ask me to bring it just one Lee County. So that's basically what the bill does, Mr. Chairman. Delegate Guy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So basically this allows Lee County to move money from operations to capital? Uh, yes, I would, I would say that. that would, it would allow them to do it, whether they'll do it or not. This was uh, brought to me by their school superintendent, and uh, it'd be up to the elected uh, board members to do that. Uh, so you're going to starve Delegate operations guy. to pay for Delegate guy. Okay. Uh, there's <laughs> there's not uh, there's uh, not enough money in uh, Lee County. Uh, just uh, they just uh, struggle with uh, uh, what they've uh, been faced with and uh, a reduced population, a declining population, a declining school population. So uh, that's I think they've lost maybe six, six seven hundred kids in the last ten years, twelve years, something like that. ADM. All those that would like to speak in favor of this bill, please come up. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, Tom Smith, Superintendent's Association, we're in support. As, as the delegate said, this is, this is going to impact probably two or three school divisions that are some of the poorest in the state. Uh, they, they just need some flexibility in order to try to meet a, a multitude of needs uh, that they're struggling with right now. So we're in support. Mr. Chairman, members of the subcommittee, Jeremy Bennett with the Virginia Association of Counties, uh, we're in strong support of the bill. It's just another tool in the toolbox to allow localities to uh, address a very pressing need, which is school capital construction, and uh, provides us with local flexibility in these communities to address that issue. So for those reasons, we support the bill. All those that are opposed? Delegate Robinson. Um, Yes, uh, Mr. Chairman, just to address the bill, I, I, what I like about this bill is that they're looking for an out-of-the-box solution, um, and I think that's what we need to be looking more at, and, and so I would like to move to report. Been a motion to report and second House Bill 80 up. It's been a motion to report and refer to appropriations House Bill 86. It was properly seconded. Members will record their vote on the electronic voting system. Yeah. 
clerk will close the roll. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Delegate Kogor. That bill fails to report on a 3-3 vote. Delegate Delaney. House Bill 410. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Um, I do have a substitute that I would like to introduce. And I can describe that for you if you're ready. Please do, Delegate Delaney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the substitute before you requires local school boards to uh, develop and enact policies to require that timely written notification is provided to parents of students who undergo literacy screening and services or who do not meet the benchmark or any assessment used to determine at-risk learning in pre-K through grade 12. It requires that such notification include all assessment scores and subscores and any intervention plan that results from that assessment. There's been a motion and a second to approve the substitute. All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed? Uh, the substitute is before us. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so the issue that we're uh, addressing with HB 410, currently local school systems can perform literacy and response to intervention screening and services, such as reading intervention and dyslexia screening without notifying the parent or guardian of the student uh, receiving those services or screenings. This takes the parent out of the conversation and uh, care of their child and takes away valuable time from the child and their family who will want to seek further care or intervention. So this bill before you provides a solution, um, a simple solution by simply notifying guardians of literacy and response intervention services and screenings uh, their child may receive, as well as the scores and subscores for those screening. This allows parents and guardians full transparency in the development of their child and allows them to decide how to further support their child outside of the classroom. And Mr. Chairman, I do know that there's uh, at least several folks that are here to um, speak to, their, to this bill and their experiences. Uh, if they could come up, if we could have the proponents of the bill speak, and we, we have at 850, so. Hi, good morning. Um, thank you for allowing me to speak uh, today to request your support for HB 410. For parents to meaningfully participate in their children's education, it's imperative for them to have all of the information to do so. Knowledge is critical and crucial in parents' ability to support their children's academic growth and should start from the very, very beginning with teachers working as a team. Parents must have the same data and intervention plans as educators in order to support their children's progress. I can say for my son, who's dyslexic, in second grade he was what they called triple dipped and I didn't even know. He was with EL students, he was with his self, um, he was with a teacher, and he was also with a reading specialist. And I am one of those parents who was there every single day at school as a home mom, as a room mom for my twins in two different classes. So I didn't even know, and I was there every day. So um, please support HB 410 and promote parent engagement and collaboration between families and educators. Thank you for your time. Mr. Chairman, just briefly, uh, Todd Gacky with the Family Foundation. Um, we support this bill. It's a good parental notification bill, and uh, just offer our support for it. Is there anybody in opposition? I, I just have one question around the response to intervention and exactly what that means, because I think I know what that means, but. You know, a little, bit of a little bit of knowledge is a dangerous thing. So can Delegate Delaney, you or anybody else speak to the kind of what response to intervention would mean there? Because that's the only part that I'm a little unsure of. Sure, and I, I might like to ask if any of the parents or uh, representatives from de uh, dis decoding dyslexia might be able to be more specific than my understanding, which might be the same as your understanding, Mr. Chairman. So response for intervention is a general education intervention where they're giving you a little bit of help, but it's not special education where they're required to give you the scores. So this is you're screened with either PALS, VKRP, um, or they could do MAP testing. There are a, a lot of different screening that they're doing in our schools and progress monitoring. And so the problem is, is that the parents do not get that information of those scores and subscores. And then after that, 
The next thing is there, are you familiar with uh, tier one, tier two, and tier three? So I'm talking about tier two intervention, which is general education. So this would be for all students. This would be the behavioral, the, what they call VTSS, the Virginia Tiered System Supports here in Virginia. That's what RTI is. Okay. Does that help it at all? Yeah, thanks. And we have someone from the department as well. Hi, Emily Webb with the Department of Education. Um, I do just want to clarify that there's no single thoroughly researched and widely practiced model for uh, response to intervention. This is, as uh, the constituents said, a broadly defined as a three-tier or three-step process that uses research and form interventions to support academic or the behavioral well-being of students. Follow-up. Sure. <laughs> So are we okay with that? those three words, response to intervention, being in here? Because that's the only part I'm a little afraid of is if there's no, like, there's no fixed thing and we're just like, it's like jello. Yeah. Um, I mean, I would say that there's no widely practiced model that, um, you know, is response to intervention. I could try if you want to. Sure. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Stacey Haney, School Board Association. I I think that because of the way the bill is structured requiring school boards to adopt policies that do these things, I think that we could define it in our policy consistent with how each school division Got it. uses it. Perfect. Thank you. Delegate Guzman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And this is this question is probably, I'm, I'm not sure if it's for the Department of Education or teachers in the room, but from parents' perspective, I usually teachers go over the test results during the first parent teacher conference where they will tell you um, what are the results are for the test and they elaborate and go on an objective program throughout the year. But I'm not sure if that is a requirement or just my teachers do it in the schools that my children are because it's just that's the way that they do things. And Mr. Chairman, if um, families would like to speak to this from their personal experience, I'd welcome them to come up briefly. But uh, in response uh, to Delegate Guzman's question, you know, that's the reason we, we were asked to carry this bill was by parent advocates who did not have that fortunate experience. I know um, for those of us who, and I have someone who I think can speak more personally to, to that than me. Um, they don't have to. And can when I, they well, don't well, have well, to. First, one yeah. second. Delegate can I Marshall. Move to report? We're good. There's been a motion and a second to report House Bill 410 um, up to, to report as sub, the substitute House Bill 410. It was properly seconded. Members will record their vote on the electronic voting system. There we go. Uh, clerk will close the roll. That bill, that bill as substituted reports 5 to 0. Thank you, Delegate. Thank Delaney. you. Thank you, um, members of the committee. All right, uh, and so we are next going to take up uh, House Bill 975, Delegate Guzman's bill. And we need a motion to incorporate House Bill 1323 into this bill. So if I could get a, there's been a motion. Can I get a second? been a motion to incorporate House Bill 1323 into House Bill 975. Can I get a second? All those in favor say aye. Opposed? All right. House Bill 1323 has been incorporated into House Bill 975. Uh, Delegate Guzman, please go ahead. Um, Mr. Chairman, I would like um, to present a substitute. Been a motion and a second to move the substitute. All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed? All right, the substitute is before us. Do I go over the substitute? All right. Mr. 
Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, the substitute is Sue on line 55 at the word general. And then on line 56, strike 17 and insert 20 instead. And that will be the position of the bill. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, um, House Bill 975, I'm carrying this bill for the administration. This bill amends the standards of quality and staffing requirements for English language learners teachers to meet the growing population and needs of English language learners beginning FY22. It increases the ELL as English language learners teacher ratio from the 17 positions per 1,000 students to 20 positions per 1,000 students. So it will be one position for every 50 students. The governor has introduced budget that includes uh, $20.6 million to cover the expenses of this bill. Over the last 15 years, Mr. Chairman, our student population has grown 6.2%, while our English learner population has grown by 48%. There is a very stark achievement gap between our English learners and their peers. Last year, 78% of Virginia students passed their reading SOL test, but only 35% of our English learners did. Likewise, 82% of Virginia students passed their math SOL test, but only 59% of our English learners did. Our current system is clearly insufficient for addressing the needs of young learners, and by investing more in English language, teachers, English language, learn, English language learners teachers, we can provide better support to those students, closing those equity gaps and ensuring every child in the Commonwealth graduates ready to succeed and thrive in our communities. The last time we talked about English language learners on this uh, body was in 2005 and 2006. So I think uh, the, num the allocation to cover the services in the school does not reflect the need. For that reason, I'm presenting this bill, and I am happy to work with the administration on this uh, critical issue. And I hope it's the will of this body to pass this bill. Uh, Delegate Robinson. Mr. Chairman, um I support this initiative, and I move to report okay. and refer to appropriations. There's been, a, there's been a motion to report the substitute and refer to appropriations. Uh, do I have a second? All right. There's been a motion and a second to report and refer the substitute to appropriations for House Bill 975. Members will record their vote on the electronic voting system. Clerk can close the roll. Uh, that reports and refers on a six to zero vote. And Delegate Wilt, we've got like three minutes. Think we can get it in? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Committee members, we can darn sure get the introduction in. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, before you is House Bill 1653. And we're all familiar with the fact that we, have, we are decreasing the ratio of uh, counselors to students down to one to 250. And there's already a shortage of counting. Mean, even at whatever ratios uh, school divisions have now, they're struggling to find uh, counselors. And so what this legislation would do, um, it, would, it would allow um, other licensed counselors in, in certain fields to be able to be brought on by the school divisions to help meet that ratio. Mr. Chairman, that's about as simple as I can put it. Anybody to here to speak in favor of the bill, and please keep it to a sentence. Thank you. Oscar Scheichel, uh, Superintendent of Rockingham County Public Schools. Uh, Mr. Chairman, the, one of the uh, first questions I received when I became superintendent was from a school counselor and said, how can we get more help with the mental health piece? And teachers will tell you uh, that that is one of the key pieces where they're struggling to focus on their key tasks. And um, 
I know theoretically uh, school counselors are there. Um, I know from superintendents in my region, uh, they don't have a single applicant sometimes when they post for a school counselor. And so um, when we talk about this particular attempt to provide flexibility, it, sometimes flexibility can be used to say, you know what, let's have uh, an easier approach. But in this case, um, what this allows us to do is hire people who are the at the top level of qualification for one of the most difficult uh, tasks that school counselors um, have to carry out in addition to their academic and career uh, counseling. And, and so this would provide us the expertise at that level. Thank you. That was not a sentence. So everybody else. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, Tom Smith, Superintendent Association. I'll try to do it in one sentence. I think uh, Delegate Wilt and the superintendent uh, described it very, very succinctly. Uh, we're in support. We're hearing about these issues from across the Commonwealth. Stacey Haney, on behalf of the School Boards Association, we support the bill. That's what's that was a concise one sentence. Jeremy Bennett, Vaco, ditto. I don't think I can do it. Becky Bowers Lanier with the Virginia Alliance for School Counseling of the Virginia Counselors Association. We have a lot of concerns about this bill. We've just now this year talking about getting a 1 to 250 ratio. The governor's funding that. What this is saying, we believe, is that a counselor is a counselor is a counselor, and that's not true. Uh, professional counselors do not have the skill set that, skill, that school counselors have. There might be the case where a, a professional counselor could assist in providing therapy in the schools, but that's not what the school counselor is designed to do. And so if we are at 1 to 250, you have five, five, like Tony and I were just, as Delegate Wilt and I were just talking, if you have two counselors you hired, one is a school counselor, one's a professional counselor, let's just say, in using this scheme, this model, then you still have a 1 to 500 ratio for a school counselor. And you have an individual who can provide mental health services in a different way. And so we have concerns with this. If we could do it as a pilot study, it might be good, because then we could figure out if it might work. But as a general thing, I think we have problems with it. Thank you. Sorry about the time. Brett Welch, Virginia School Counselor Association. We are also not in support of this bill. Uh, similar to what uh, was just said, school counselors have a very different role and feel different responsibilities. Uh, it, this does not necessarily mean hiring at the expert level to fill school counselor positions. The bill says other licensed professionals. That can also include QMHPCs, uh, which have much lower qualifications than school counselors. So that's a concern to put people in these positions who don't have the qualifications. As an, as an organization, we are ready to develop programs, certificates, other things to be able to hire people and get them to the qualifications. We understand that there could be a staffing issue in the rural regions, but we have a plan for that. Um, but this bill as it stands would dilute this so that ratios really wouldn't be addressed using school counselors, psychologists, social workers. It wouldn't move the needle and potentially nothing would change. Thank you. Delegate Marshall. A question for the patron. So Delegate Wilt, we heard that, uh, that maybe you wouldn't get as many no's up here if this was a pilot uh, program. Would you be in favor of that? Yeah, Mr. Chairman, I would say yes, and we'd be honored to have Rockingham County serve as that pilot. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so do we want to do this on the fly, let it go by the week? Pass it by the week. Let's pass it by for the day, yeah. and we'll see you next week. Thank yeah. you, Mr. Chairman, for your indulgence. See you. So is there, a, notice. is there a motion to, to pass by for the day? Yes. Second. There's been a motion to pass by House Bill 1653 for the day. All of those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? All right, we will see you next week, Thank Delegate you, Will. And uh, we need to do a little bit more housekeeping, which is we need to pass House Bills 694 and 1294 by for the week as well, so we can address them uh, next week. So if I could get a motion to pass by House Bill 694 and 1294, that would be much appreciated. So move. Second. Second. There's been a motion to and a second to pass by House Bill 694 and 1294. All those in favor say aye. Yeah. Opposed? That motion carries. We almost got through this docket. Uh, so next week we have about 13 bills. We should be able to get through this workload. Can I get a motion to adjourn? So, so moved. Second.
There's been a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. aye. All those opposed say no. Meeting is adjourned. <laughs>